hopefully you guys get a lot of good information out of this. And uh, for those of you who are new to considering GSA as an option for your future sales, um, both in services and supplies, uh, welcome. And uh, you'll get a ton of, of baseline information here. And those of you who are current GSA vendors, I'll also try to cater to you and answer some questions uh, that you might have to improve your market. So um, this is me. I am uh, currently the General Supplies and Services Management and Program Analyst. I worked previous to this job in the Customer and Stakeholder Engagement Division in Region 4. And uh, during that period of time, I worked with vendors and customers, um, mostly at uh, Patrick Space Force Base, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, uh, NASA, the uh, South Florida for Southcom, uh, and all the VAs in, in Central and South Florida. Um, during that period of time, I, I really got a good hang of uh, what the customers were looking for um, in a vendor and, and how those vendors could improve their odds of winning um, business with the federal government. So uh, with that being said, they asked me to do this session. And even though I'm not in that office anymore, um, and I'm more on the backside doing analysis, uh, I was really excited to come talk to you guys. So um, I will jump right into it. Uh, we'll cover questions at the end, but today's agenda, we're, we're going to go over some GSA overview, uh, make sure that we give you some perspectives for marketing tips. Um, I'm going to provide uh, information on Office of Small Business Utilization. That's really going to be your go-to for those small businesses. Uh, there's, you know, I can answer some questions, but I'm not a uh, contracting officer and I am not in the Office of Small Business. So, uh, I'm really just going to give you as much information as possible. And then after this, you want to get in touch with the Office of Small Business Utilization if you have questions specific to that. Uh, we'll discuss the importance of market research. And I'm going to outline some tools that are going to be available to you guys to conduct market research and create a strategy that's targeted, backed by your data. And, and with that data, you'll be able to you know, understand the advantages of being a GSA contract holder, um, and finally, we'll talk some tips and tricks that I've learned over the years uh, utilizing uh, GSA eBuy, eLibrary, and GSA Advantage to market your products. All right. Um, so, really, GSA's mission, right? Uh, the mission is to deliver value and savings in real estate acquisitions, technology, and other mission support services across the federal government. Uh, if you don't know, we're broken into a few different sections. Public building service is one of our biggest uh, with 8,000 plus assets, uh, and it maintains 350 million plus square feet of workspace for over 1 million federal employees across the country. So uh, PBS is really big. Uh, you, if you have business in the public building service or leasing or, or you know, things like interior design and construction, that's where you want to focus a lot of your energy. Uh, for those small businesses that, um, you know, do things like security and landscaping, construction and architecture, I would definitely look into public building service as a, a way to learn, earn some more business. And then there's also the Federal Acquisition Service known as FAS. Um, many of you have heard of FAS even through this uh, training, right? Federal Acquisition Service Industry Symposium. Um, really, this is the, the bulk of our business is commercial goods and services, right? We want to provide the best value uh, for the federal government and manage the multiple award schedule, right? So multiple award schedule is that GSA schedule, that, that big swathing, uh, multiple SINs, multiple award schedule uh, that we operate and, and most of our business is executed under that. So uh, it's important to understand the, the distinguishment between the two. And uh, most of the stuff we're going to cover today is going to be fast oriented. All right. So Office of Small Business Utilization. Uh, it is a nationwide responsibility for GSA small business programs and to be a chief advocate for small business. Um, if you're not a small business and you're large, obviously, we still want you to be part of GSA, but we have nationally mandated requirements uh, to assist uh, small businesses. So we have the Office of Small Business Utilization. Um, we do this by connecting small businesses with the right people and resources to help them grow and be advocates, right? Uh, there are billions of dollars in sales to small businesses through GSA Advantage. 
um, and through GSA eBuy every year in, in goods and services. So uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're trying to help those businesses continue to grow. Uh, and I believe we are going to have, maybe Jocelyn was going to put in the chat, the uh, Office of Small Business Utilization uh, website so that you guys can reach out to the contact that's closest to you. So take a look in the chat and grab that uh, and get really familiar with that person. All right. So you want to know how GSA is broken up. We have 11 regions. All right. So, so each region is, it's, it's a little bit confusing, but each region is responsible uh, from that headquarters office for the states that it's responsible for. Uh, and there's within those regions, there's different divisions, right? There's customer and stakeholder engagement. There's office of small business utilization. There's acquisition assistance. There's contracting. There's legal. There's policy. And every division uh, has different regional responsibilities. I work in the central office, so I'm not necessarily in a region anymore. I used to be in region four, which covered Florida. Uh, but you want to get really familiar with uh, the people and the, the office of small business in your region, if that's applicable to you. Um, and you can find this on the GSA website. Just search GSA regions and you'll be able to click and navigate and, and find who's who's important to you. One of the other things that's really important in here is if you don't know who your customer service director is for the federal customers within your area, go to gsa.gov um, and search for the CSD locator, customer service director. Uh, there's hundreds of customer service directors around the country, even abroad um, in Europe and Asia. And those customer service directors, right now they're going through a little org change. So they're going to be assigned to accounts. So for instance, uh, when I was at uh, Patrick Space Force Base, I managed the Air Force and NASA accounts. Um, there would be a team of us who were responsible for Air Force or a team of us that were responsible for NASA. Um, and those people could be in region four, but responsible for a NASA account in Texas. So uh, it's a little bit confusing right now, but reach out to the, the closest person to you and they will direct you on uh, the account that they're responsible for. And those people are boots on the ground, um, usually co-located uh, with the customers. I, I was at the 45th contracting squadron at Patrick and I could walk into the contracting office anytime I wanted and ask questions about open solicitations and things of that nature. So um, it's really, really important to help with your market research. All right. Um, okay. So you want to know how to develop leads, right? Uh, this is really important because if you don't have leads and you don't really know which way to vector your attention, all right, data is going to be so important in this. If you go into it just thinking, oh, I'm close to this base, I can, uh, you know, definitely sell my product or, or service to them, but you don't go into it looking at the, the data associated with that agency spend, then you're going to be kind of barking up the wrong tree, right? So you want to find out which federal agencies purchase your product and service? Number one, most important thing, how much are they buying and have they awarded set-asides? If you're a, a SDVOSB or you are a disadvantaged business or women-owned small business or an 8A, those set-asides are really important because typically if they've set it aside in the past, they'll set it aside in the future. Obviously, you can't guarantee that, but um, there's usually a perpetual uh, re-award to another person, uh, another vendor within that same category, as long as it's still applicable from a, a cost perspective. So you want to do that. Um, who are your competitors, right? Who's <clears throat> who's currently holding the contract that you want to win? Find out who that that vendor is and and make sure that you're you're mirroring the things that they're selling or doing so that you can compete in that federal space when it comes time for RFIs, RFQs. Um, and then obviously, uh, when you are figuring out who those competitors are, you're also looking to see what contracts are going to expire in the near future. I say this because not all contracts are going to be recompeted, right? But 
if a contract is open market, and, and when I was a customer service director, I helped vendors uh, or I helped customers find GSA solutions that they could move their open market spend to a GSA spend specifically because of spend under management protocols. What you might be able to do is identify a contract that is an open market contract that is work that you can do, whether it's goods or services. And if you can do that and, and against your GSA schedule in the future, then you can approach those people who are making the decisions in their acquisition strategy a year, 18 months out from when that's expiring, approach and say, hey, I understand this contract's gonna expire. It's an open market spend. I can offer this on my GSA contract. I think it'd be a good idea if you competed it under this SIN. A SIN is a special item number um, that we use when we classify all of our goods and services. So uh, I'll get into that a little bit in the future, but really this is how you develop your leads, right? You're, you're using the data and the resources and, and continuing to refine that strategy. All right, so when it comes to defining or refining that data and the overall strategy, uh, and you've, you've you know, kind of figured out which direction you wanna go and where do you wanna grab data from, um, it's important to effectively utilize these resources. Once you have that data, you can strategically choose the right events to attend. The, you know, I know NASA does a really big, uh, industry symposiums, you know, similar to this in, in person every year. Um, I spoke at that previously and, and there were thousands of vendors there and, and they had all the program managers from all the programs on, on the installation at, from every installation flew into uh, NASA at Kennedy Space Center and, and were there in person, ready to talk about what their upcoming projects were, what they needed, you know, what are their pain points with their current contracts, things of that nature. So make sure you're looking for those events and you want to attend them as, as much as possible. Uh, sometimes those are, are posted on, on uh, solicitation websites uh, and, and, you know, or word of mouth or through the small business office at the base uh, or, or facility that you're looking to work with. Uh, maximize time and matchmaking events. Um, I know the, the governor of, of every state has uh, federal and state procurement matchmaking. Uh, state agencies can use GSA uh, for IT services. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's limited. It's not for all professional services, but uh, it's, there's, there's some things the state agencies can use. So if you get to go to a matchmaking event, make sure that you're going to one that makes sense uh, for you. Uh, and then know your agency forecast tools. We have a forecast tool I'm gonna share with you um, here in a little bit for uh, agencies that report to us uh, and, and also that we grab from other areas, but every agency has their own forecast uh, for, the, for the year and they all publish it. So uh, check each agency for their forecast tool uh, and make sure that you're using that so that you understand their spend. Uh, with this, you're gonna become more efficient, right? So you're not gonna be running around chasing leads that don't really exist, uh, thinking they do just because a base has something doesn't necessarily mean that base is the one that's paying for it. So uh, with all these events, you'll be able to find out who the person who makes the decisions are and, and spend the money wisely. Um, and then obviously there's a, a, a ton of other ways to do this. Uh, I'll touch on a, a couple few in the next slides. All right. so. Um, you're going to conduct market research, right? So part of that is understanding that landscape. Um, once you have a clear understanding of your strengths and weaknesses, the opportunities through expiring contracts or upcoming contracts, and then also threats to the marketplace. Nobody really could have seen COVID-19 coming, right? But now that we understand that it did happen, what are your understanding of the threats in your market? for if something similar happens in the future, make sure you position yourself to address these constraints ahead of time and really just understand how to capitalize on what you're good at and be prepared, right? And you're in a competitive position. Um, you're identifying your target agencies and departments, right? So use those that data. Don't, you know, I, I always 
told people just because the Air Force is the Air Force doesn't mean that every base has a flying mission. Some bases are, have no aircraft at all. So if your target market is aircraft uh, materials, then you don't want to go to a base that primarily doesn't have a, a flight mission as your target market. Um, and, and obviously, they don't have the need. And then part of this is going to be develop a strategic plan on how you'll focus those efforts, right? So once you've identified that target agency within the federal department, now you can develop your plan for long and short-term goals on how you're going to capture those opportunities. Are you going to reach out to the contracting officer directly through their FPDS uh, contact information? Or are you going to search them out on LinkedIn? You know, there, there's a million different ways to get to the end of the road. Um, and, and for you, you want to really have an idea of who you want to get to and start chipping away at, at the best ways to get in touch with those people who are making the decisions. Then you can develop that marketing strategy, outline the activities that you're going to pursue, then refine the approach, right? So uh, now you're saying like, man, Sean, you got all these really cool ideas. Uh, you know, I understand market research. I went to college. I get it. I, I, you know, we all were in business. We took these classes. You're just telling me stuff I already know. But you got to know where to look, right? So one of those places to look is FPDSNG. Um, so Federal Procurement Data System is anything that the federal government purchases that's $3,500 or more has to be reported to FPDS, right? So um, the micro purchase threshold, although it, you know, in the last couple of years increased to $10,000, um, it, it could change some of these reporting, but typically everything that's over 3,500 is reported, right? So you can look for the small wins, you can look for the big guns, the $1.7 trillion, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to, to, to approach it. Um, but it's a repository of contract and actions. Every time something's done against a contract that's posted here, whether it's a uh, recompete, a RFI, a just a notice, a change in funding, um, so it's really good historical snapshot of the current awards. And with that, you can determine, oh, man, this, this is kind of how the agency manages this contract. You can get ahead of that and offer a more streamlined process to help them manage it a little bit better, right? Um, FPDS can also tell you which federal agencies are buying the product and service. So one of the ways to determine that is through the NAICS codes, right? Or NAICS or 9 million different ways to say uh, NAICS, right? So the North American Industry Classification System is used, um, you know, for broad classification. It's the, the big overarching classification. And you guys probably have your NAICS loaded in SAM. Uh, one of the things I will reference here for those vendors who already have GSA schedules or you're kind of new to the game is... You may have gotten your GSA uh, contract awarded based on a single NAICS, but in SAM, you have six or seven or eight different NAICS that you operate under in different spaces. I highly recommend you go to GSA eLibrary, and on the right-hand side, there's a link for all of the SINs, right? So it's a, a directory, a SIN directory, uh, category directory, and any NAICS reference there that has an applicable SIN, a special item number, you want to do an ad mod and get that SIN added to your contract. The reason I say this is because these NAICS are and PSCs are how the contracting officers <clears throat> will determine whether or not GSA has the appropriate vendor pool in order to compete their product, their, their uh, work whatever it is that they're trying to, to buy. So if they if, if you offer and you have one single NAICS and that uh, customer searches eLibrary for a different NAICS that you could have offered the same product under two separate NAICS, then you, you might not ever even see that RFI or RFQ because it's not posted under the one single SIN or NAICS that you used um, for your, your, the basis of all your awards. So 
Uh, make sure that you add as many sins that are applicable to the nakes that you have in Sam. Um, I, I highly recommend that. Don't sell yourself short. Uh, and if you worked with a third party vendor and they didn't add every single nakes that you have, ask the question why. Um, because a lot of times they're just trying to get your schedule using the most frequently um, utilized NAICS that you have, but it, it'll reduce your opportunities for sure. Uh, and then PSCs, PSCs narrow it down, right? So uh, make sure you understand uh, what PSCs that you can fall into. Um, and they're, they're, you know, more specific um, that describe products and services from a more detailed fashion. So Obviously, you want to understand those as well. <clears throat> Here's some additional info for FPDS and G. Uh, there's a data dictionary, very important, so that you can understand, um, you know, specifications and things of that nature. And then there's a report manual on how to use ad hoc reports. FPDS and G has tons of reporting features. You can pull a million different ways from Sunday on data um, and sales and awards and the whole nine yards. So. Um, definitely use that on FPDS and G, and there's their help desk contact information. All right. I'm going to do it on time. I think we're halfway, right? So um, with that, the tools uh, to conduct market research through GSA is going to be very important. So GSA eLibrary is typically going to be your, your go-to to understand GSA contract information, um, look at your competitors. Um, catalogs, the whole nine yards. Use GSA eLibrary, get in there, click around, search for, you know, your different NAICs, search for your SINs, search for your competitors, search for, you know, you name it, search in there and use the links on the right-hand side. There's also a schedule sales query plus that we offer through D2D. Um, there is the link here uh, in the slides. And uh, I, I think we can drop that in the chat as well. Um, and that is huge because then you can search specifically the SINs that you have and see all the previous awards to GSA vendors for those schedule uh, sales. Uh, that's a, a really, really good feature. Uh, and then USA Spending. I found a uh, $1.5 billion requirement uh, for uh, Cape or Patrick Space Force Base, Cape Canaveral, um, 45th Space Wing that was an open market award that could have been awarded on GSA Oasis, which is a specialty um, professional services for engineering um, contract. And, and when we were able to explain, well, there's a lot of different NAICs that fall under it, but, but this one was for engineering specifically. And we were able to discuss through, hey, you could save a lot of money using GSA schedule. Uh, and then that turnover you know, they considered it in their acquisition strategy and, and considered that turnover. So USA spending is a really good way to find out what the spend is um, on, across 90 plus agencies. All right. Uh, forecast the contract and opportunities. I mentioned this earlier. You can use this as well. Uh, this is on uh, the acquisition gateway, which is a cool GSA.gov tool. Um, there's the link. Uh, and again, we can put that in the chat. And it's been around since 2016, and and you know just a way for GSA to communicate information to on potential upcoming contract opportunities. So you can see forecasts, you know, all the way out, uh, sometimes up to five years. Uh, okay, so we punched on this a lot, right? Market assessment, uh, your target markets, competitive analysis. Um, really just knowing the key players in your market. Maybe sometimes you don't want to go after an award as a prime. Maybe you want a subcontract, right? So uh, what are the demographics of the group um, of vendors that are, are offering the same things you offer? Um, what are the trends? Are, is the size of the market big enough to where, you know, you can kind of compete for things? You know, is there enough work or is it, you know, beating your head against a tree over and over and over again, and, and there's there's just not enough work uh, or market growth in that area. You want to really understand that competitive analysis. And then, of course, regulatory restrictions. Um, if you do engineering, that's it's there's things like the Brooks Act that fall, falls into play. Um, you know, if you do IT, 889 compliance, uh, Buy America Act, there's 
there's a lot of regulatory restrictions that you need to understand before you can market your business to the government. And it, it, if you don't pay attention, it could cost you big time, right? Um, so make sure you're understanding regulatory requirements and restrictions. Uh, and do your, your SWAT, right? I focused on that earlier. Make sure that your opportunities are the ones that you truly can influence. Use, uh, you know, I, I don't like to market one way or another, but things like GovTribe um, or GovWin, they're, they show tons of information on opportunities, your, your past uh, competitors, things of that nature, right? So maybe look for the low-hanging fruit. What What is coming up where you know your competitor is closing their doors and you know something in a year is going to recompete? Maybe go after something that's kind of a quick win opportunity um, in the short term. And, and obviously, you have a short and long-term uh strategy. If you're only looking at stuff this year and next year, you're selling yourself short. You need to be four or five years out because when that period of time comes where they're doing, you know, NASA does this historically, things over a hundred million dollars, they're looking at their recompete strategy and they're, they're making a decision on their acquisition plan 18, 12 months out. So if you go to them nine, six months before the contract expires, you're going to miss that opportunity. So you want to already have your game plan together three, two, year and a half out at least. Um, make sure you're really going hard for it. All right. Um, okay. So GSA advantage or advantage, right? Using GSA, uh, pre-negotiated ceiling prices, right? This is why you're going to choose multiple award schedule. It makes things easier for the buyer right? The buyer is the person spending the money. So if it's easier for them to make an award and it's faster on multiple award schedule, nine times out of 10, they're going to want to choose the cheaper and faster rate, right? Um, this is typically based off the fact that we are pre-negotiated contract ceiling prices. And, and I know the 4P tool is rough. We've recently implemented Spell that should help with some pricing. If you guys have you know, run into that issue, but we're, we're making improvements on the, the, the post COVID analysis of fair and reasonable. So uh, there's a lot coming for that. And, and hopefully that'll, that'll help. Um, your, your contract is also far compliant, right? So if you have a contract with GSA, everything that you sell on your multiple award schedule, that contracting officer knows that it, it, your terms and conditions are, are compliant with the federal acquisition regulation. And They've already verified your socioeconomic status and you maintain that socioeconomic status for the life of your contract. So it makes it easier and, and more streamlined for that contracting officer to say, oh, we, are, we don't have to vet this company's uh, financials. We don't have to vet this company's socioeconomic status. We, we've, it's already been done. You know, those things are, are getting ahead. Um, and obviously it, uh, it provides access to things like emerging technologies, innovative solutions, things of that nature. So, um, okay. Again, I, we're, we're not going to hammer home too much on this. Make sure you're going to the right agency location, but key players are really important. Is it the contracting officer making the decision? Is it the program manager making the decision? What are the names and contact information? Are you building a, a database of these people and communicate in as regularly as possible. Make sure you're doing that. Um, track your upcoming opportunities. Know what the agency's small business goals are. So if you have an 8A and you know that they're short on their 8A goal for the year, you can pitch that, right? Hey, we're an 8A. If you make this direct award to us, you're going to meet your 8A goals. They want you to help them meet their, their requirements, right? Uh, and know who your competitors are and that you can beat them. All right. Uh, customer service directors, I talked about these earlier. Uh, there's also national account managers. Uh, go Google GSA CSD, and you'll be able to find a contact for whatever agency is closest uh, to you that is doing business that you want to talk to. Um, here's some tips for success, right? So CSD promotes the use of GSA um, tools, right? Um, we also, or by we, I mean me previously, 
go around to the different uh, customers and and encourage them to post RFIs and sources sought. If you don't respond to the RFI or sources sought, then the cus- the contracting officer says, oh, GSA can't do this work. And they move on and they push it to open market. But if you reply, then they have to consider GSA as a solution, right? So if you have a schedule that co- that contracting officer is typically going to post on GSA eBuy before they go out on, on the open market. And if they have enough vendors respond, then their market research pretty much stops there, right? So make sure you're responding to RFIs and sources sought. I can't tell you how many times we've lost business that could have been to a GSA vendor that just wasn't replied to. Um, attend those industry days. Sometimes Patrick Space Force Space has, has this really cool thing. It's called a pitch day. They do it like once a year. Um, and they invite, they put out an RFI. And if you respond and you get picked, you can come pitch your product or service to meet a need for Patrick Space Force Space. And they make the award on the spot. It's really neat. So look out for things like that. Uh, strategically manage your time and, and matchmaking events. Again, we touched on that. Um, network with other GSA contractors. You're not in this alone. There's some vendors out there, and especially if you're new, that have done this for 20, 30, 40 years. You want to get with those vendors and and team up, right? Be a sub. You know, maybe go into uh, some sort of agreement, right? So, the, the, in my opinion, it's always better to to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, check GSA eBuy for opportunities. Um, eBuy has tons and tons of information. So uh, make sure that you're using that. All right. I'm burning. Uh, federal supply schedule price list. You're going to have a price list. It's very important that it's correct. I am on a program right now where I'm, I'm sending a scorecard to vendors every two weeks with their order status score their on-time score, and their cancellation score. Every single week, I have vendors respond to a suspension notice and say, hey, um, I I can't, I have to cancel these items because my price isn't correct. Or I have to delete items from my contract. Cool, we'll submit an EPA and a delete mod. Look, I know it hasn't been great in the past as far as timing on those things, but we've hired a ton of contracting officers, they're redistributing work and things are getting better. I promise uh, we have we have a lot of changes that are going into place right now. So if you haven't done one recently in the very near near past, go ahead and, and make sure you get your contract uh, squared away. Uh, that's my personal plug on this one. But at the end of the day, uh, you want to make sure that you have that ready to go so that you can share with prospective customers anytime they ask for it. Um, and they they have you available right on the spot. Um, currently, you submit your, your catalog in SIP. Um, SIP's going away. It's going to be replaced here in the, in the near future. Uh, but right now, make sure that when you submit your catalog in SIP, it's accurate. I can't tell you how many times people upload essentially the same items, um, ETS, which is ETS, essentially the same to Ability One products, um, which is a no-go, uh, or upload wrong pricing or items that have been removed from their, their their catalog and they accidentally didn't remove them from their file that got uploaded in SIP. Anyway, make sure that's really, really tight. Um, all right, I got 10 minutes and five slides. I'm going to burn through and, and open for a few questions here. Uh, this is where GSA eBuy notifications come from. I put this slide in here so that you could see when a customer is posting an RFQ and they click that little blue button there, it gives them a list of every vendor who's on that SIN. This is how they do market research. The more SINs that you are in, the more opportunities you will get. So make sure that you're you're updating your catalog. Uh, and if you get a notification, for an RFI, respond to it. All right, uh, make your website GSA friendly. Um, use logos. Um, as a GSA schedule contractor, your um, catalog can be posted there. Um, you know, really just make sure that 
when a, a customer goes to your website, they're like, oh, here's their catalog and they know right where it is, right? Um, here's the logos. You can get it at gsa.gov forward slash logo uh, for your approved logos. Uh, some additional solutions, the Vendor Support Center, uh, we offer that. That's for anybody who uses PO Portal. Uh, Vendor Support Center is there for you. Um, the Small Business Support Contacts uh, for GSA and then GSA Events. Uh, these links can all be added in there um, to the chat. I'll throw them in there if, if, uh, if we have to. And boom, questions. We got like nine minutes. I figure that'll be enough to go off on a tangent here and there. So um, let's go ahead. Wow, I flew through that. I'm sorry if I was going too fast. Um, wanted to make sure you guys got as much information as possible. Oh, look at all this. High five, everybody. That's awesome. I appreciate you. Um, that so, is awesome. I sh I, if you want, Sean, I can go through some of the questions that were received. Yeah. yeah all start right. Uh, so one question is, is there a limit to the number of sin slash snakes we can use? No. As many, as many as you have in SAM that you can show past performance, you can add to your, your GSA catalog. Amazing, amazing. Through a, through a mod with your contracting officer. So reach out to the CEO and ask them, hey, how do I do a SIN ad mod? That is amazing. Okay. Um, there is another uh, question. And, and and just so you know, guys, I'm going to go off the questions from the Q&A pod. So please type your questions in the Q&A pod. And uh, we'll go through as many questions as we have the opportunity uh, to go through. And then um, if we do not get to your question today, we will um, make sure that they are posted on our uh, site that's listed, as well as the resources page. Um, so here we go. Uh, the next question is, is there a single centralized listing of all the agencies in their forecast, or at least some of the larger ones? So use the acquisition gateway forecasting tool. Most of the big um, overall agency uh, forecasts are located there. Um, and again, it's only those that share it with us. We can't go to, to every agency head and say, you have to give us your forecast because they publicly post it at their discretion for, you know, on their public facing uh, interfaces. So um, the acquisition gateway forecasting tool is probably your go to start place. Thank you, Sean. OK, another question. Uh, it says, can you show the slide about making our website GSA friendly again? Yeah. Do you reference that slide? How about that? All right. So we'll keep that slide up just for a little bit and address mm -hmm. the next question. It says, can you have the same labor uh, labor categories, LCATs, project manager, <laughs> for example, across multiple SINs? Or do you have to be SIN specific and can't be duplicated? Okay. Uh, talk to your contracting officer on the language that they will accept. If you have had it, the problem, the problem is your project manager description. So project manager one, project manager two, or however you label it. If it's so generic that <clears throat> you can apply it to five or six different sins that cross uh, industry boundaries, then you're you're not writing your sin description appropriately. You need to remember that when a, a contracting officer is looking at a sin, they are looking at the description and then pairing it to their labor category need. And if that sin dis that that um, LCAT description you have is so generic that it doesn't thoroughly meet what they're looking for, then they're going to say, no, this, this vendor is not capable. So you want to find that line between overdoing it where you have a gajillion project manager descriptions 
and and underdoing it where you have one that crosses multiple um, fields. Now, if you have uh, five different sins that are all engineering and your project manager one could be in all five engineering, yeah, put them in all five. Because that project manager for engineering for mechanical is probably the same description as electrical and computer and rocket and wh whatever other industry you're, you're looking at. So I hope that answers that question. Um, be as specific as possible, but, you know, also not too over the top because then you could do the inverse and, and cancel yourself out from being able to use it in another sim. Great, great answer. Okay, uh, we have about um, uh, three more minutes, so I think we have time to squeeze in one more question. Okay. Um, and uh, this question is from uh, Gail, and she says, hi, any chance the VSC will add accessibility for more than one person? Our CEO has access, but I can't, but uh, I can handle most of everything related to the government uh, relations and mass contract details. That is a great question. So, um, yes, they're working on that currently at my office's request. I I can't give you a definitive timeline, but there the that is something we identified in our um, delivery improvement issue is vendors would only have one person who could update the PO portal and uh, or or their contract terms and conditions and via login. And when that person went on vacation, nothing got updated. And then we'd send a suspension notice saying, hey, you didn't update your stuff. And they're like, well, I wasn't even in the country. So we asked them, hey, can we get more than one uh, login? Uh, in the meantime, an alternative to that is sometimes you can actually, this mentions it, establish a company email for GSA inquiries. If you use that Comp that group box that everybody has access to when it sends the two-factor authentication it'll send it there and anybody using that should be able to log in if they'll allow you to do that um, again i'm not a contracting officer and i'm not in the vendor support center so uh, contact them and ask them actually the phone number is right here i'll put it in uh, the chat thank you so much Okay, well, let's see if we can get to one more question. There was an, a question uh, about an industry day. It says, is there a place that lists all the industry days? We are having a uh, tough time finding them. No, uh, not that I know of. Maybe there's a, um, yeah, I have. I don't know. I'm sorry. I wish we did, but we, we just don't track everybody's industry day. Uh, we that's, only, yeah, that's a definitely a uh, tough one because it's it's yeah. used, sometimes it's just, it's specific to a particular program or a particular category. So unfortunately, we do not have a list for that. Uh, but I want to invite us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, that's yeah. wonderful. Well, we just have one more minute. Uh, first of all, Sean, thank you for this information. Uh, very great presentation. I want to remind everyone that uh, please still ask your questions in the. Q&A pod. If we did not get an opportunity to answer the questions, it will be posted uh, to our website. Um, also, there uh, you can go to our resources pages for a link to um, any of the, the, the actual presentation. So uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we're going to end this session at this time. I just want to say thank you guys for attending and thank you, Sean, for the wonderful presentation. Yeah. Absolutely. My pleasure. And uh, I don't know if you guys do a feedback survey. I'd love to hear if I could do anything better. <laughs>